2020 audience. This is the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. I am Liz Hinline, creative director, filmmaker, and XR director. And I could not be more proud and more excited to present to you two masterful directors who know their craft. Um, we're gonna have 20 minutes of conversation then 20 minutes, you can reach out and ask questions. Please do, these women know their shit. Excuse my French. And with further ado, let me present Sarah Prozac and Nicole Cassell. Hi, ladies, thank you so much. Hello, hello. hello. Thank you. So thank you. exciting to have you guys. So I have lots of questions. You should see how many post-it notes I have around here. But my, my first question is, you guys both did amazing first features. And where did you, A, get the chutzpah to make your first feature? Like, who, what pushed you to do that? And then what did you have to do to get that butterfly up off the ground? <laughs> Nicole, <laughs> you go. In 20 minutes or less. <laughs> um, chutzpah. It, it, I mean, so I saw the, well, quickly, saw the woodsman as a student when I was at NYU. Um, it was a free play and it just changed me. I felt profoundly that, you know, lightning bolt experience of walking in one person, walking out another. And therefore it felt like a story I wanted to tell. It took a lot to get there. You know, I think I saw the play in 99, but we were filming by 2003. And before it came together, I really hit rock bottom of like, it's never going to happen. And what am I going to do with my life? And there's nothing else I want to do. So it really came from the only thing I wanted to do in my career was to be a director. And, um, and the screenplay had won a competition. So I knew it had that there was some reception out there. I think every time I hit the low point, a little tiny spark of hope would come along to keep keep it going. Um, so that, yeah, and then and then it, Lee Daniels read the screenplay. He was like, "We're gonna make this." Took a while to find uh, Kevin Bacon, but then once he came on, the cast just fell into place because his role was the most ri risky. And then, even then, with all of that, it took a while to find the financing. But, um, you know, credit to Lee Daniels to really pull that side of it together. Wow. And, and did you have to do anything to prove that you could direct a feature? Did you have to, for Lee to take it on? I had um, the, I, well, I'd gone to NYU for grad film. And I, the, the good fortune I had was that the year the screenplay won, the, the Woodsman run, won the Slam Dance screenplay competition the same year I had a short film at Sundance. Mm -hmm. So I had that package. Um, but yes, the first question was, would you sell the script for us to find another director for? And I said, absolutely not, because I knew if I didn't direct that script, I would never get a shot. Wow. Wow, it's big stakes, really big stakes. And Sarah, Sarah, you're still on your amazing festival run. Yes. Uh, so, so where did I? You know, you've always been such an amazing filmmaker, and now, and to to hustle and get your first feature off the ground, how did you do that? Well, I have to give a shout out to Nicole actually because her story really inspired me. I thought, um, I really thought about her a lot because I was trying to make it and I felt very, um, just, you know, you, everyone watching this and Nicole and you both know you've made a feature too, Liz. Um, it feels like it's your baby. You want to do an amazing job. You want to do it justice and you don't want to shortchange the storytelling. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you don't do it, if you don't push forward and you keep waiting for permission, it's not going to happen. And I remember hearing a story Nicole told about meeting Kevin Bacon in a setting that wasn't a traditional casting setting. Um, and she just took the courage in her hands and went over and said, you know, I'd love you to get involved with this project. And that was, that was a really inspiring story to me. It's like, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to go through the regular route. 
right. you can go, okay, I'm going to bootstrap this. I'm going to get myself together and I'm going to do it. And, you know, when Nicole made her film, and even when I started making my film, it was just before the Me Too thing when I was writing it. And, you know, women weren't getting a look in really. Uh, in docs more, uh, in some indies, but um, you still had to prove yourself. And I, I even had a few people look at my script. It had won a few awards. Um, and did the same thing like why don't we get so-and-so to direct it and i was like no this is my film because we had very different roots i i came up paying my bills by directing tv commercials etc because i had done a uh, experimental film degree which doesn't really you know <laughs> create a short film or any kind of product that you can get out there in a way that can convince people that you could make a narrative dramatic film. So long story short, I bootstrapped it using a lot of inspiration from Nicole and um, some other female directors and, you know, advice and support um, from other friends like Dennis O'Hare, my good friend that you know, Liz, mm -hmm. um, was very supportive, helped me with my Kickstarter, etc. But, you know, it was a micro, micro budget. Didn't I even produced it because the producer dropped out at the last minute, my star dropped out at the last minute. And I had to get another, I had to cast someone else. But Mark Menchaka, who plays the lead, stuck there with me, who I also met in a social situation. And I said, can you get attached? And he had just done The Outsider, not The Outsider, he'd done The Sinner and Ozark and, you know, not a big name, but a really solid uh, character actor. So anyway, yeah, and that's it. So now it's out there in the world. It's playing tonight in LA at Sherman Oaks Drive-In Movie Theater, part of the Method Fest. Wonderful, that's so great. Please go if you're in LA. So on that note, you, you guys both are dealing, how did you work with your actors with such, both had, at least in those features and other works, sensitive material that for your actors might also be personal? How do you work with actors in, in that scenario? Um. Well, for me, it, it, it's, I work with actors in the same way for every scenario, where it's what's, um, what's their backstory, you know, and um, spend, you know, and I first off try and figure out the actor a little bit, you know, how much they want to talk backstory and such. Um, but with especially Woodsman and again on Watchmen with like Regina, you know, we just spend a lot of time talking about who who is this character and what's their background and then um and then every scene just really knowing um i go through the exercise when writing or ad working on a script of putting myself in the actor's shoes to think about what they're feeling so that if i want to give an adjustment i have that word mm -hmm. you know a little more this a little less this you know just but to be very succinct um but key you know and as a guest director on episodic i made sure to have either seen or read every episode leading up to mine so that the actor knew i knew everything they've been through and sarah how about you with because you had young actors as well and a very sensitive yeah model. For people who don't know, the, the film is called Hashtag Like, and it's about uh, predation on the internet. Um, and I didn't want to make a story showing the predation because I don't think any of us need to see that. But I had a fictional story that followed up using that backstory. Um, and I talked about how the grieving family deals with the rage and the pain associated with it. But I did have to show kids in danger a little bit and some old videos and pictures. So it was very challenging, you know, you can do a lot with editing, music and pacing, um, but you didn't want to show anything and you had to, it had to be told as a visual piece of storytelling. So that was challenging. People will see the film. I think, I think folks who've seen it will say it was successful because you don't want to be exploitative at all of your, of your mm -hmm. characters within it. But at the same time, you want to have your audience feel the stakes. Um, acting, I really agree with Nicole, like the best thing you can do is stay out of your actor's way. 90% of them, if they've already got to the place where you cast them, you know you've worked with them a little bit in casting or they've been on a show forever, um, 
they know what they're doing. You just have the global and you have to tweak it a little bit. And, you know, Elia Kazan said that directing mm -hmm. is in casting. Um, so yeah, I was very, very fortunate. Mark Machak is a, a phenomenal actor and um, Sarah Rich is a new discovery. She is incredibly sensitive, but also she built the character from the ground up. She was incredibly responsible and prepared, which made my job really easy. She knew what she was doing. She knew where she was coming from and she knew more importantly where she was going. So. Do you guys both naturally uh, gravitate towards social justice themes or topics um, because a lot both of your work reflects that mm. I do for sure you know it's very important to me that anything I work on hopefully leaves people with something to think about or talk about long after seeing the the film you know it's it's so much work and so much of your time and life given to it um, and that's what I go to see also so it's really um you know the first thing i think of when i'm reading something is like would i want to watch this you know how about you Sarah? yeah no i agree i'm, I'm doing big dramatic pauses because i don't want to talk over nicole because we have a pause um yeah no i totally i totally agree because you know with film you're uh you're with something for between two and five years, depending how involved you are as a producer or, you know, as someone involved in the, the development of it. So you have to care about it. I am not interested in candy, some kind of rom-com situation. You know, having said that, if it was a, if it was a clever thing, you know, I've just been addicted to recently to The Good Place, which I never wanted to watch because I'd heard about it. Um, and then when I watched it, I was like, oh, they're putting some medicine in this candy. It's very interesting mm -hmm. about being a good person and uh, personal responsibility. So that, that was cute, but I agree. And you know, Nicole, I've really admired her work. I loved Rectify. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a very subtle, very intelligent piece of work about that subject matter. So yeah, but definitely let's do something that we want to spend our time on. Totally, but do you think that is also that film has a, does film have to have that purpose to, to not only entertain, but to teach? No, I think there's all, um, you know, everybody has different appetites and I love that it, all of those exist, you know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm married to a doctor who spends a day living very real life issues and is happy to, watch something very different than I would um, just to relax and, and that's serving a real purpose. So there's no belittling others. It's just a personal preference. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. What's that movie Sullivan Trap, Ch Sullivan's Travels about the producer in the forties or the thirties? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. I agree. I don't, I, I think entertainment is great. It's exactly that. It's entertaining and people have hard enough lives, especially today. Do that. It's a different thing about what you're crafting, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's what Nicole said. You don't, um, it's how you spend your time. You know, I can watch, I'll watch a housewives show. I'll watch, you know, that's my guilty pleasure. If I just want to zone out completely, Beverly Hills Housewives goes on the television. My husband walks out of the room, but <laughs> you know, there is a place for that. But then what you put your shoulder behind is a different thing. Exactly. We all, you know, sneakily watch the Kardashians at one point or another. Um, <laughs> so t let's just dig into craft a little bit. What do you guys do? What's, do you have a, a prep method? Is there, do you storyboard? Do you shot list? Is it, do you grab images? Like say you have a script or you're being for hire, what would, what would your, like one, two, three prep big. All of what you just said, <laughs> you know, to me, uh, you know, prepping a script is, it's kind of peeling in the onion, but um, I definitely shot list and storyboard, you know, it, it really depends on the project, but, um, um, you know, I'm actually posting on Instagram right now, the lookbook I created for Watchmen just to show actually that process of like what went into the pitch is guidelines to what is saying how I would make this. And, um, you know, prep is just a massive process of going through the list of thinking about lighting, camera, 
acting, casting, costume, props. I mean, production design, the whole thing, you know, and it's everything in front of the lens and where the lens goes has to be decided and discussed and planned. Um, so it's, and then, you know, and rehearsing. And then when you bring the actors into the set, it all comes to life. You know, that's the little chrysalis in the middle of it all. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And Sarah, do you do anything like, do well, you know, sauce? Yeah. In my background, we share a similar background of commercials and then I did a ton of documentary work. So in commercials, as you know, you have to be in, so locked down, you know, it's, uh, when we were doing it, it was, you know, $5,000 a minute or something if you were screwing up, you know what I mean? So you're, you have to be so prepared and you're only making something for 30 seconds, but you could shoot for three days for a 30 second commercial. You could shoot more than that. Um, so you have to be incredibly prepared exactly as, as Nicole said, and that's really fun, you know, uh, talking about what would my character wear and why you can help, you know, in commercials, it's obviously, you are not worried about backstory per se, but you have to make sure people feel comfortable and appropriate and you feed it as a visual storytelling medium again. So you, you, you're telling a story with every single thing that you show on the screen, the mise-en-scene. Um, whereas the documentary work I did, I would do like just, you know, thumbnails, rough storyboards. Like I was, I shot a, a show for National Geographic. I traveled to Papua New Guinea and um, shot a show there. And I just had hopeful scenes and hopeful frames. So I would draw out like, I know we're gonna go shoot at this river where we're gonna be going out in a dugout canoe. I would love to get this shot, that shot, and this shot if I can. But then if the people don't want to do it, you don't want to interrupt them. You have much less uh, agency in organizing what your scene is because they're not actors, they're real people. Yeah, no, it, it's not all, I mean, I find the prep actually the most fun and, and exciting part because anything you hope, you know, at that point, you're like, anything's available. Where do you guys, because, you know, I find also as a, as a teacher, it's like there's, you know, we're so saturated visually every moment of every day on our phones, on our this with the ads. Where do you, how do you create visuals that break through that or that your subconscious is not regurgitating things you've seen from before in your next projects? Do you know what I mean? How to make something original. <clears throat> the original, exactly. That that just doesn't feel like it's biting off of some style that's in the air, which um, commercials used to do that a lot. Right. Um, I think it's being true to the script, true to the story, you know, and the story. Um, I don't, I mean, that's, it's, there's many angles to that. Like one is being aware of what's in the world right now and just making sure you're not, you know, repeating someone. Um, but to me, being really truthful to the story and then to you, you know, because we all beat to a different drum and, um, you know, I have a way of using the tools that's different from it, Sarah or for you or any other filmmaker. So as long as you're being truthful to yourself in the script, it's when you're consciously like trying to do something that's not in your DNA that you might trip up. Well, also, and we also, everyone, we watch lots of films just to get inspired, to look at craft, to really understand story. So I think that does seep into our into our minds and into our styles sometimes as well, which is not a bad thing um, to reflect on others' work that sort of somehow subtly shows up in your own work. Right, I think it's, you know, you can call it ripping off or paying homage. And, you know, and again, every art forum deals with that. We have a little over a hundred years of that to work from. Think about writers, painters, photographers, like, that's that's art um, being inspired by and then and then taking it forward and I think um, you know to me being inspired or inspiring someone is the ultimate compliment you know so I hope the people that I've obviously been inspired by um, feel that they've inspired me rather than I've ripped them off you know.
Well, they say if, 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 if you take it from one person, it's ripping off. If you take it from multiple uh, mm -hmm. situations, then, it, then it's the homage. Mm -hmm. And also yeah. you have to remember that you're the filter. So mm -hmm. if it goes through you and, you allow, you're, and you're consciously going, I'm not going to do exactly this, but then it filters through you, you're building on top of, of, of um, established work. So, you know, you read Flaubert, you're not going to write a Flaubert novel, but there might be things in there that really stimulate you and excite you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the people watching this who are students, I say read tons, watch tons, and don't worry about aping someone else's work. You let it go through you. You know, how am I going to shoot something living in Brooklyn that is referencing, you know, the 19th century? Mm -hmm. You know, think about that. And also break the rules. You know, that's the, that's what makes things truly original. You know, mm -hmm. you're told don't cross the line. Why? You know, I love Lynn Ramsey's first film, Rat Catcher. You know, it's this very, very raw, real script. And then suddenly there's a fantasy sequence of, I'm thinking of a boy and the, and the moon or, you know, something um, that should not work. And because of that, it makes it so unique and original. Mm -hmm. And it's her vision. She was true to her vision. Exactly, exactly. So I'm curious, Nicole, on your, um, your Emmy-nominated Watchmen episode, bravo, 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 bravo. There are many filmic genres that sort of go through the episode. And is that, my curiosity, is that, was that in the script? Yeah. And then how did you, did you have to, did you come forth with multiple ideas for different parts of it? Or did you have to pitch about it or sell about it, you know, to, to. Well, that's, so when I read the script, the first thing I said to Damon Lindelof was, I feel like I've read a visual version of the song Bohemian Rhapsody. And that, that song just journeys through all these different genres that, mm -hmm should not work mashed up together, but it's brilliant. And I felt like I'd gone on this totally insane, amazing ride with reading that pilot script. And my mind was just firing off visually the whole time. Um, and then how I did it was again, just it's, it's being truthful to each scene. It opens in a black and white 1905 film, make that film. Then we, end, we enter into Tulsa 1921. What do I want that to feel like? Make that. Then we land in 2019, an alternate present tense. What is that world going to look like? What's the musical going to look like? Black Oklahoma, I get to make that up. Um, so an American hero story, all those, the Jeremy Irons thing, all of that scripted, um, even, you know, and he, he wrote in the scripts, like you suddenly were in like remains of the day. And so I took that and I was like, well, what's my version of that? Um, so the, what, the reason it works is because the script works and trusting that the script works. So being truthful to each scene, making sure these, uh, there's these killer transitions that knit it together and then that's what you get, <laughs> you know? Um, but again, what you're asking is exactly, did I have to sell that? Yes, because, you know, when, when writers are hiring directors, it's very subjective at that point. So that's why I did the lookbook that I am presenting because um, I wanted to be very clear, this is how I see it. And this is, if you hire me, this is what you're going to get. It puts you on the media, immediately on the same page with Damon with, and HBO, you know? And then when you're in pre-production, it becomes a really huge tool. Like instantly, everybody knows what the feel of the show is. And if there's ever in there any doubt, you just go back. And I think one of my most proud moments was after seeing the pilot air looking back at the lookbook and being like, wow, it's, it's, it's there. And yeah. so even if you're not asked for a lookbook, I find it enormously valuable in making sure, because what's in your head, there's no way to 
words can't describe it mm -hmm. and can't ensure you're all in sync. And it's such a stressful project, you know, these when a lot of money's at stake, even if it's a micro budget, it's a ton of money, you know. So there's a lot of stress and anxious people. And the clearer you can be that this is what we're doing, the more confident everyone can be. And also what you're working with a writer who's so visual mm -hmm. and from, you know, the graphic novel medium that it, were you on point? Did you find yourself on point with all the scenes or were there adjustments that had to be made? Cause, oh no, I saw it this way. Oh no, no, he's a very trusting, no, I mean, that's why I love working with Damon. That's, I've been on The Leftovers for two seasons. I knew he's a writer that's a great who um, is so profoundly trusting of his directors. That's amazing. And, and just curiously, how long so, did it take you to put that uh, pitch book together? It was fast. I was on another, I was on another shoot and doing it at night. Wow. You know, it was, that was a hard week. <laughs> that was one of the hardest weeks of my life, um, work-wise. You know, as I was uh, directing on Castle Rock. No, Cast, is that what it's called? Um, oh my God, I just had a brain cramp. But I was working on a shoot and, um, and doing that off on behind the scenes uh, for probably in like five days. Wow. Yeah, it was hard. That hard. is hard because you have to really wrap your. Yeah, but again, I have I work with a graphic designer who's invaluable. So I create the copy, and I send her ideas of the images, and then she does searches. I pull the selects, I figure out the chapter order, and an idea for layout. She does a presentation that's back and forth, back and forth. Um, but, and is she finding the pictures as well? Yeah, that's what I mean. So I send some ideas, mm -hmm. you know, this is like conformist seven, you know, these are the, here's five films that I'm responding to for each chapter. And then she does a search of like hundreds to thousands of photos. So then it's a call it down. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of back and forth, but, um, and, but I couldn't do it without that support. Oh, totally. I don't and do this, Photoshop or all, any of that. Yeah. No, who has the time? And those picture finders are invaluable. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 the depth that they have is mind boggling when you find someone who's great. Yeah. Um, so for both of you, we have a question of when did you guys know that you wanted to be in the film business? What and what was the thing that the charge that happened? Do you want to go first, Sarah? Yeah, it's a weird, funny story, and it's not, it's kind of just goofy, but um, my mom was friends many years ago with this woman called um, Mrs. Rosson, that's what I always used to call her, and her husband was Robert Rosson, who was an incredible director in the 50s and 60s, and uh, we visited her once, and we, uh, she had an Oscar on the mantle, Mr. Rosson had since passed away, and uh, she, um, she let me touch it and hold it. I was young, I was nine or something. And I was like, this is great, what is this? She goes, this is an Oscar. And, I was, and it was for uh, uh, Alexander the Great, I think. But she was staying at the Plaza Hotel in New York. And this is like a, such a New York story, but I always loved that book, Eloise at the Plaza. And she took us for lunch downstairs. And I remember my mom was super broke at the time, so we were very appreciative. And we went into the dining room and there was a woman sitting at this table, the head of a table of all men, beautiful, stunning black woman who had just walked in and she'd taken off her mink coat and she got the, the waiter to bring an extra chair for her mink hat. She put in the chair next to her and it was um, Diane Abbott. And I loved her and she was in Julia. And I said, Mrs. Russell, that's Diane Abbott. She's in Julia. And she said, honey, honey, go ask for the autograph, go ask for her autograph. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I was too shy and she, she made me go ask her. And I always think about this, this little girl going up through the plaza and going, hi, could I get your autograph? You know, and um, 
I always fantasize that she got her, her series re-upped because she got like a fan in the plaza. But really, when I went back to the table, Mrs. Rossen said to me, you know, you could make TV and movies too, Sarah. Mm. Nice. nice. Light bulb, light bulb. Yeah. And uh, I was, uh, I came to New York for college and was in my dorm um, first week during like early, early um, in school starting and a bunch of kids came, were in my room and one kid came in and popped in a VHS of a short film he'd made. And it was um, Henry Alex Rubin, who's now a great documentary and filmmaker, commercial features. Um, he showed the short and it was a lightning bolt of, I want to do that. And I didn't know humans did that. You know, I was definitely grew up seeing movies, but I was not from the film world at all. And it was just something you went to the movie theater to do. And that connection of someone my age can do that. And I felt this, it was truly a lightning bolt of jealousy in the best way of like, I want to do that. It took many years to make it all happen, but it was very, very clear in that moment. And I have to say one thing, it's a Diane Abbott, it's Diane Carroll, not Diane Abbott. Yes, Diane Carroll, exactly, exactly. And so, I agree, can I add one little thing to what yes. Nicole said? I think, don't ever feel shy about feeling jealous of something. I think there's a healthy jealousy that mm -hmm. um, it, it's just basically the universe or your, your unconscious telling you where you want to go. So, you know, embrace that jealousy and support people that that might stimulate it and 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 go towards that yourself yeah. you know you don't want to take anything away from anyone else you just want to add to your arsenal yeah exactly exactly it's how do we deal with those feelings and and it, but there's a lot of energy there that's the whole thing the lightning bolt the energy the the pal that like i want that too um neha asks um being an actor it is a pleasure to hear you powerful ladies mm -hmm. want to grow like you my question is, what kind of approach do you adopt to motivate your actors and to get what you want from them in their role? Good question. Sarah? Oh, no. I want, I want to hear what Nicole has to say. I'll, I'll add a little thing. All right, right Miss uh, Nicole. Well, I definitely don't think it's my job to motivate an actor. If someone is not motivated, they're not going to be on set. Uh, they're, they need to show up to auditions and be willing to play. I think it all really does happen in that audition. Somebody who comes in ready to play. And, um, and the way I feel that out is um, even if they nail it, like on the first take, um, what I want to look for is somebody's range. Can they take direction and, um, and be just willing to play? Like, it's, you know, we're here, let's do this. And, and I've heard actors say that the work is not the movie or the TV show, the work is the auditions. And, you know, I think for all of us, there's things in our jobs that are not what we love to do, but, but what we have to do. Um, so being willing to play and, and also really knowing that an, a director giving you direction is not saying that you did something wrong, it's like, let's just dial it this direction or that direction so that we can have choices in the editing room, but it's not a criticism. So having that confidence that you're just gonna give um, is, is invaluable. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would agree to that, yes and, that uh, what Nicole does and, and didn't mention, but I'm sure she does, is creates a safe space. So you have to just create a space where, because once you're working with someone, um, in my limited experience of films and just even in um, documentary or commercial, if someone's put, opening themselves out to be on the line, their brand and their, uh, their persona is on the line. And you have to make them feel that you have their best interests at heart, that you will take care of them. You will catch them if they fall and, and, and create a, an atmosphere of love and trust. I go at it as though they're family that, you know, that I love and I just want, I want everyone to win. Mm -hmm. 
when you're in the casting though, how do you get the best out of like nervous actors or younger actors or how do you, is there things that you do to, to soften the blows? Like the, sure. I can talk about that a little bit because I had to see a ton of young actors and often like when Nicole's on a TV show, she's provided the cast already. Um, I guess, anyway, you can talk about that. But um, when I worked with the casting for my movie, I said, okay, let's just not be on script. So they didn't have to worry about remembering words or remembering, they had sides. So they kind of knew the world of what they were playing. And then I said, okay, let's try it like this. And let's bring in another person. You can play with them a little bit and see what they're, they're all about. And, you know, some people feel like they want to um, win the thing. And I said, okay, why don't we just do this totally non-verbally? Let's just do a whole thing just non-verbally. So you just feel the character, feel it in your body and just do like an improv without any words. And that often is really nice for casting. I've, I've had that experience. Yeah, and I'll also just say that, because um, I've also worked with a lot of kids and um, what, I, what I do with, with all actors, I make sure to be as close to the camera as possible. You know, sometimes I'll be back at the village if I'm needing to really see something specific in the frame. But um, when I find a child having trouble being natural, I'll just get right by the camera and um, just let it roll and just just keep going, you know, and, and give them the tiniest adjustments um, and talk them through it very specifically. You know, literally, and sometimes even literally being like, okay, say it that way, but with your eyes down, eyes up, you know, just very, very specific can um, make an actor who's a little stiff. And it's really only the young kids that can be that kind of stiff. Um, I mean, sure, anybody can, but um, I find just really getting, I'm talking to them literally from like two or three feet away, just behind the camera. Just go again, go again. And, and it, it's, um, it leaves us both exhausted, but, um, but for a very, very vulnerable moment or important performance, um, I, you, that's what you've gotta be willing to do. Mm -hmm. Is that what you did in your opening sequence in Watchmen? No, because that was, that was e like, that was a boy just joyous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was, that was easy. Um, he was also just, he was that kid. Um, so he, you know, I'm sure we did takes, but nothing, um, that he, he didn't need my hand holding at all. Danny, he was amazing. Yeah. Fairly special, a really mm -hmm. special talent. Um, we have a question from, I'm gonna bastardize this name and now they just slipped down. Pragya Verma, what could be the suggestions for a cinematographer from directors like you? I guess how to work with best with their directors. Um, my experience is they, they're, they're your biggest, biggest ally. They're your partner, they're your ally. Um, I think if, if you're a cinematographer that uh, wants to work with directors, um, you know, that, that have something to say visually, you sit down, as Nicole said, you prepare, you look at your visual materials, but also you, you talk about um, expectations, like talk about how you like to work, ask the director how they like to work. You're a partner, don't ever feel like they're your boss, but you also want to make sure that you understand that uh, you are not their boss. So, you know, I've seen some, some DPs that will, uh, sometimes out of nervousness, and this is, you know, more inexperienced people, will try and control the set in such a way you don't have to do that. You have your ADs, you have everyone else there, you have your producers, just put your head together with your director and support their vision and, and make sure they listen to you and you listen to them because it's not a one way street. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say it really is that, that team collaboration and um, 
having passion for passion for what you do and the material is first and foremost to me you know just loving what you do loving the craft um and coming in with ideas you know it's it's i definitely have ideas but i want to be um challenged or um inspired also um and really just being willing to do the work it's it's so much it's hours and hours of prep and um to give to give your all and you know on the pilot for watchmen with andre Parekh, um he likes to start with going to a museum together um you hear that <laughs> i have a okay i'm gonna hit mute i'll talk for a second while that's going on actually i thought that was at my house um, <laughs> i'm gonna run and problem solve I'll okay, back. So, so actually we're at the end of the show okay. um oh. and you guys are freaking amazing i'm so proud of you too thank you so much for being here quickly is there a place that people can watch your work or not stalk you but like just inst uh do imdb pro you know it's yeah i don't have a website or anything um okay. yeah and uh, people should look at your instagram i mean that's amazing that you're so generous that you share these lookbooks etc i think that's a real teaching tool uh, for me too, I'm Pixie Hale at Instagram and my film is called That's Hashtag right. Like. Thank you. Okay, thank right, you everyone. Thank you, New York thank Film Academy. Thank you, Sarah and Nicole. That was awesome. We put out thank five. you so much.